Okay. Uh, good afternoon. It is April 28th. Today at 2 o'clock, I am going to be going over 8th um, grade, uh, chapter 20 of To Kill a Mockingbird. So, um, as you guys uh, filter in, I will be happy to answer any questions that you guys have over uh, last week's assignment, this week's assignment, or um, just the chapter in general. So, um, first things first, let's start with the speed reading assignment that I assigned uh, on the 20th. Um, this assignment requires that you pick a story from this list of 40 or so stories. You can pick whichever one you like. After you pick a story, you are to read it and then uh, record how quickly uh, you read each one of those stories. Um, you have to read each story three times. Uh, no story is longer than a page and a half, so none of them should take you longer than, say, three or four minutes to read out loud. Um, presumably, you guys will get faster each time you read it. Um, the idea is that you read it and record it the first time. Hi, uh, Brianna. Uh, welcome. I'm just going over the uh, reading um, assignment on the web page. If you go to Google Classrooms, uh, you can see what I'm talking about as I go over it. Um, it is under the 20th. Um, it looks like this. If you click uh, Speed Read Challenge, uh, it will bring up um, these two um, links. The fluency packet has uh, reading passages. None of them are more than about a page and a half. The idea is that you read that passage um, out loud and you record how long it takes you to read it. Um, after you read it the first time and record your speed, you can either read it silently again or you can click the blue link and then that will read it out loud to you. Um, after you listen to or read it again silently, you have to read it out loud um, a second time and record your speed and then a couple hours later, maybe the next day or so, read it a third time out loud and record your speed again. The idea being that your speed should go down each time. Um, and as you go through the last couple of weeks of class, this uh, practice reading out loud should just increase your overall reading fluency and just your overall speed. Um, I know you guys aren't getting uh, the opportunity to read out loud in class as often as uh, you would have without the quarantine, so this is kind of an activity to help with that. Um, it doesn't matter how fast you read it. Um, or how much you improve the grades just on whether or not you did it. Um, and you can have your parent uh, time you, or you could just use a stopwatch on your phone uh, for that. So um, while I have you here, Brianna, uh, if you have any questions of, for the assignments uh, that are on the webpage, I'm not sure what chapter of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird you're on. Um, all of the um, chapters are actually on the webpage. If you go to the main Google Classroom page um, under uh, materials um, all of the chapters show up. Uh, you might have to scroll kind of near the bottom to get to them but they're all on there uh, near the bottom uh, all the chapters are on there. I also put a couple of video links on there um, for you guys. I found a link to a play version of To Kill a Mockingbird so you can watch that um, it's listed under March 28th. You can click on that and watch it. Um, there are a few clips I put on there through YouTube um, that lets you uh, watch clips from the black and white movie. Um, there's also an audiobook link which will let you um, listen to all the chapters of the book and they're broken down into uh, the chapters so you don't have to listen to the entire thing at once. I also have the uh, texts Text, well, I can't talk, text versions of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird from chapter uh, 6 all the way to the end. I think we were on chapter 11 when the um, whole quarantine, quarantine thing hit. So um, all of those should be on there for you if you need them. All right, so what we're going to do today, um, I've been doing um, summaries of each chapter each week. Um, the summaries are on uh, the classwork section and they're basically just like a Google slide that kind of goes over the key points of each chapter. There's also a quiz for each chapter. You can click on those. Um, the summaries 
that I provided give you a lot of the answers. Um, so if you read through those, uh, and then there are also normally a, a uh, video that kind of goes over what we are going over as well. So uh, I'll start on chapter 20. Um, if you have any questions, just interrupt me. Um, there is a delay between the video and um, what I'm saying. So if you type a question, it might take me a second uh, to uh, answer it, but I will. All right, so chapter 20. Chapter 20 is the closing arguments of the trial. So the trial lasted for three chapters, the first chapter being Hectate and uh, Mr. Yule, the second chapter being, um, or the, the following chapter being Mela, the third chapter being just Tom Robinson's uh, initial questioning by Atticus, and then the cross-examination by the prosecutor, Mr. Gilmer. Chapter 20 begins... Um, after Dill and Scout have left the courtroom. Um, Dill had to leave because he kept crying. He was upset with how um, unfairly Tom had been being treated, uh, specifically by Mr. Gilmer. Uh, Jem, Scout, and Dill all kind of think Atticus has proven his point, especially Jem. Um, it's physically impossible that Tom Robinson, having only one hand, um, could have done things the way in which Mayella described them as having happened. Also, um, Atticus pointed out that it was much more likely that her father is the one who beat her. And he also gave a pretty uh, logical reason as to why Tom would have um, helped her uh, with her chores. So um, Atticus, in Jem's mind at least, has won the case, but the case is still continuing. So before you get to uh, hear Atticus's uh, closing arguments, there's an interaction between Dill, Scout, and Dolphus Raymond. Dolphus Raymond, we mentioned before, is a white man who has um, mixed children with an African-American woman. So remember, this is 1930s. This is a deeply segregated um, uh, period of time in the South. It was actually illegal for um, white and black people to uh, marry or have relations like that. So the fact that uh, Dolphus Raymond um, has like a mixed family and the fact that he is from a very wealthy prominent family is really scandalous for this time period so what Dolphus has done is he pretends that he's drunk all the time and he walks around with a paper bag where he and he drinks coke from it but he pretends that he's drinking alcohol from it a few people are aware of the fact that he's not actually um, on alcohol um, but it kind of gives them an excuse for his behavior. So he has a conversation with Dill, and he explains to Dill that he's not actually drunk. Scout doesn't believe him until Dill actually like, takes a sip of the Coke, and he you know, explains that it's actually just Coca-Cola. Um, Dolphus kind of has a almost like a kindred spirit vibe with Dill. Both of them disagree with the way that segregation works and how unfairly... Uh, people are being treated under this system. And uh, Dolphus, ex Dolphus explains that as Dill gets older, he'll still disagree with it, but it won't make him cry as much. Like, he'll be able to internalize those feelings, and uh, he won't have to uh, break down as often. So he kind of gives Dill, like, a pep talk almost. Um, and he explains for his own behavior that it's not so much that he cares what other people thinks, it's that um, he needs to give them an excuse for his behavior because he can't um, completely dismiss their um, attitudes. And also, he doesn't want um, there to be trouble for his children. So kind of making this excuse up that he's always drunk allows the white people to kind of just write off his behavior. So, like, the only reason he really likes to be around African Americans so much is because he's always drunk. So they kind of um, just disregard his um, behavior that way. Um, Dolphus um, explains uh, Dill is most likely crying because um, he sees how unfair life is. And if you remember previously, we talked about that Dill represents childhood and innocence. So typically children need things to be fair, um, like a huge complaint among children, especially young children, like nine years old and younger, um, is that things aren't fair sometimes. So if you give one nine or eight year old a piece of cake and you give another nine or eight year old a slightly bigger piece of cake, the first child's going to be upset. 
um, because children kind of expect things to be fair. So that's why Dill becomes so upset with Mr. Gilmer and how he treats Tom, because the court is clearly not fair. It doesn't jive with Dill's understanding of the world, and it just causes him to break down. Um, Dolphus suggests that with time, unfairness won't bother Dill as often, and Dolphus explains the unfairness as the hell that people give other people. Um, if you remember way back when we started this story, um, one of the quotes I shared with you was like from a Roman writer, and he said that man is a wolf towards other men, suggesting that men and human beings in general can be very savage to other human beings when given the chance. So if one person's in a weaker position than another person, human beings have a tendency to treat that person in the weaker position very cruelly. And that's something that you can see throughout history. So um, Dolphus kind of um, echoes the sentiment that people are sometimes just incredibly cruel to other people um, because they can. So um, the people in the South in the 1930s have this um, excuse to treat um, black people in a very cruel manner, and some of them take advantage of it. Not everybody, obviously. Um, Miss Maudie is very um, against the trial. Um, Atticus is obviously standing up to the trial. Link D's, Tom's uh, boss, was very against the trial. So there are other people who are willing to stand up to the injustice, but um, it's difficult to um, for one person or a small group of people to change things. Um, and that's the problem that um, Atticus is having. So um, Belfus also brings up another really good point. He suggests that the children are actually getting something beneficial by watching the trial. And he actually suggests that they go back and uh, finish watching it. So if you remember, um, Reverend Sykes, who was sitting with the children, he actually a few times suggested that Scout leave and that Dill leave. But now you have an adult suggesting that they might be gaining something very beneficial from being there, kind of seeing how the world really is. Um, as they watch Atticus and Tom struggle against this uh, kind of uh, racism that's very overt and in their face. Dolphus also makes the suggestion that Atticus isn't a typical person, somehow suggesting that he's better than some of the other townspeople or braver or um, more courageous in some way. Um, if you remember before, Atticus um, had suggested that because he's older and he had his children when he was older, um, he's worried about not properly training them for the point in life where he's not there anymore. So he's worried that he'll still, they will still be fairly young when he passes away, and he wants to make sure that they um, have a good understanding of the world and how it works, and they have uh, developed good characteristics and personalities by the time he's no longer able to teach them. One thing he's very concerned with is teaching them um, what bravery is and teaching them um, to stand up for what's right. That was why he had Jem go uh, read with Miss DeBose um, to kind of teach him bravery. It's also why he never um, fired guns around them because he didn't want them to get the uh, assumption or the idea that like guns and violence is what it uh, means to be brave and what it means to be strong. So he's been very... Um, logical in the lessons that he's taught his children. Um, so you can kind of infer that he probably wants them to uh, be there at the trial because the trial is showing them um, another aspect of bravery. Um, anyways, jumping back to the trial, when the children get back into the courtroom, Atticus is finished or is just beginning his closing argument. So he has a bunch of points and he runs through them all very quickly. Um, before he begins rattling off the reasons why Tom shouldn't be found guilty, he takes off his coat, which um, Scout finds as just shocking because she's never seen him take his coat off, um, like his dress coat, before it's time for him to go to bed. He's just so proper all the time that the fact that he's um, kind of putting on a relaxed um, persona in front of the people just shocks Scout. So um, he goes over his points. Um, point one was there shouldn't have been a trial in the first place. Um, there was no medical evidence, and the witness, witnesses aren't reliable. Now, the no medical evidence, if you remember back to the um, first chapter when the trial began, he kept um, harping on the point that Mayela was never taken to a doctor, her father didn't take her to a doctor, the sheriff didn't take her to a doctor, 
and she never went to a doctor on her own um, accord. So he's kind of suggesting there's no evidence that a rape took place, right? Like in order for there to be um, a trial, he's suggesting that there needs to be um, some sort of verifiable uh, crime that was committed. Also, he suggests since there's no medical evidence, they can really only go on the word of the witnesses. And both Mayella and her father just aren't reliable. He pointed out that um, the father lied during his testimony. Um, he pointed out that so did um, Mayella. He didn't actually call her a liar, but, I mean, it would, would have been impossible for things to have happened the way she suggested them. Also, she changed her argument or um, her um, account of what happened during um, the course of her testimony as well. So he's really called into... Um, question their reliability. So that's his first point, that the trial shouldn't have even happened, and uh, there's no real evidence for um, the crime even having having occurred. Point two, Atticus um, acknowledges that Mayella is actually a very sad character. He um, expects the townspeople to pity her. He pities her himself. Um, he feels sorry for her, but he suggests that just feeling sorry for Mayella is not a good enough reason to convict Tom, right? He points out um, that Mayella is most likely the cause for everything anyways. Um, she is lonely. She needed some interaction. So she uh, tried to kiss a black man, which in this time period and in this location was a huge uh, social no-no. So um, having been caught by her father trying to kiss Tom and having been refused by Tom, She's now trying to, like, remove him, right? She's trying to blame him for what happened. Um, she's trying to take that blame that and the shame she would get for um, being attracted to a black man and just blaming him for it and having him uh, sent away, right? And Tom, or not Tom, uh, Atticus is pointing this out and explaining that she's the one who caused everything. She's the one to blame, so she should be held accountable, not Tom. Um, and that kind of goes along with point three. Uh, point four, Tom's physically not capable of performing the attack. His left arm is uh, basically down to his elbow, um, and he can't use it. He's not able to put his um, left hand on the Bible. He had to actually physically move his arm with his right arm to do so. So his left arm is basically worthless. He couldn't have beat anyone up with it. Most of her bruises are on the right side of her face, plus the choke marks that were on her neck. There's no way he could have done that uh, because his left arm just can't do it. Also, he um, Atticus points out that Mr. Yule is, in fact, left-handed, and he had way more motive to beat Mayella than Tom did. Point five, um, he acknowledges a major racist belief at the time, and that's that black men could not be trusted, especially around white women. Um, Atticus kind of acknowledges that a lot of people in the courtroom have this opinion, and he tries to argue that they're good and ba bad people of all races, that he's already kind of proven that Mr. Yule, the white man, lies. So he kind of, he tries to like point out, yeah, there probably are good people, there probably are bad people. Color really doesn't come into play for whether or not someone's a good or a bad person. Um, point six, he tries to argue that all men should be treated equal. Now this, um, looking back in like the year 2020, like this would seem like just an obvious point. Um, the thing is, back in like the segregation times through the 40s, through the 50s, and through the 60s, um, a lot of Southerners um, were upset when Northerners would try to change their culture. So, um, and this harkens back to like the Civil War era when um, Northerners tried to, um, you know, when Northerners fought Southerners uh, to end slavery. Um, there's a lot of resentment um, on the part of Southerners during this time period when Northerners come down and try to change their culture. Um, so in the 1950s, there were uh, Freedom Riders, and these were people who came on buses down to the South and tried to protest for equal rights. Um, they were looked down upon by a lot of the people in the South because it was like they were interfering with their business. So when Atticus says all men should be treated equal in court, he has to kind of um, first distance himself from the Yankees or the Northerners and say, like, no, this is just like a general um, ideal that everyone in our country should hold dear. So he tries to say this argument without tying it to, like, the Yankees. Um, point seven, 
um, Atticus says um, that he doesn't actually trust the court system because uh, court systems and any system created by uh, men can be flawed. Instead, he trusts the people. Like he points out the fact that he knows all the people who are on the jury. Um, he knows them as good people and he expects them to do their duty and to do what is right. His last point isn't actually a point. Um, in fact, Scout doesn't actually hear what he says. Uh, Jem has to translate uh, for him, for her, rather. And that's at the very end when Atticus is done, he kind of just whispers in God's name, just believe him. Um, kind of like as a last minute plea for uh, the people that he knows and the people that he's grown up with to do the right thing in this case. Even though he knows because of all the racism, it's going to be very difficult for them to find Tom innocent. Um, he still makes this last minute plea for them to do the right thing. Um, and that's the end of this chapter. Uh, the chapter ends with Calpurnia uh, marching down the center of the courtroom and uh, she kind of interrupts, but that's where it ends. So we're not sure why she's there yet or what she's doing there. You can kind of make a pretty good inference as to why she's probably there. Um, and why she would dare to interrupt the court. We've already seen how um, upset the judge became when Link D's interrupted the court. So kind of like a brave action on Calpurnia's part to dare interrupt the, uh, the trial. But in this chapter, we see a lot of uh, development in characters. Specifically, we see character development from Atticus. Um, Atticus throughout the book kind of comes across as almost like too good to be true type person like he's just too heroic he's just too good um he never really takes um credit for things um we learn from miss maudie that he was an amazing checker player but he lets his children beat him all the time at checkers uh we know he's an amazingly good shot with a gun but he never shoots guns um until he has to um he really just like doesn't take advantage of any of his gifts. He's always um, looking out for other people rather than himself. He puts his own reputation in danger. Um, he puts his physical well-being in danger when he stands up to the mob that has come to uh, attack Tom. And he's put his reputation on the line because he's defending Tom, and that's an extremely unpopular thing to do um, in the deeply segregated uh, South of the 1930s. Um, we do see some doubt creep into Atticus here, which is good because we actually see him more as a human being at this point. Um, he takes his jacket off um, so he doesn't seem quite as proper. That plea he gives at the end of his closing arguments kind of shows that he looks worried. Um, for the first time, he normally comes across as extremely confident and self-assured, but here he actually looks worried. So you kind of see that crack in his persona as like this heroic figure, right? Um Lastly, uh, symbolism's a uh, thing I want to point out. In this chapter, Dill symbolizes innocence and childhood. He symbolizes that throughout the entire story. Um, this is demonstrated in his reaction to the unfairness of the trial. You can also kind of get the idea that this would affect him more deeply because of his own um, experiences with his family, right? Like, uh, Dill doesn't have a father. Um, his mother kind of like sends him to different relatives who so gets passed around from person to person. So he's experienced some unfairness. His mother finally marries and then he isn't really wanted, right? His mother and the new stepfather want to spend time together. They're not actually abusive towards him, but they're kind of neglectful towards him. So he's already been exposed to some level of unfairness. He sees Makeham as like his safe place, and that's why he ran away here in the first place. He sees Scout and Jem as like really good friends. He sees um, Atticus as kind of like a parental figure almost. Um, and the fact that now in his safe place, he's seeing this unfairness. It's too much for him. So that's one of the reasons that he breaks down and cries. Um, Tom Robinson is symbolized by a mockingbird. Um, the title of the story is To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, so that's kind of important, right? Um, Atticus um, explained it was a sin to kill a mockingbird because they don't hurt anyone. Tom has never hurt anyone. He's a good uh, worker. He supports his family. He's only been in trouble with the law once, and that was when someone attacked him with a knife, and he ended up going to jail for it, even though the other person attacked him. Um, Atticus, or not Atticus, uh, Dolphus Raymond pointed out um, the idea that it was worse to rob a, um, a black man than a white man or to cheat a black man than a white man because 
in this time period, they weren't, they had no recourse. Um, if um, an African American assaulted or um, accused a white man of something, there was no way they were going to be taken um, um, at their word. And even, oh, hey, Malachi, um, even in this story, there's basically no evidence that Tom did the crime, but he's still on trial. So it kind of like shows the unfairness and Tom, and for that reason, represents a, uh, a mockingbird. Um, welcome, Malachi. I just went over chapter 20. Um, I was almost done with the, uh, the summary, but um, the last two uh, points I was going to leave you guys with were, uh, or questions rather, were uh, what do you think that Scout and Jem represent? So if Tom represents the Mockingbird, kind of like um, an innocent person, um, Dill represents innocence in childhood, what do you think Scout and Jem um, might represent? Um, you can think about that, um, and I will go over your assignment in brief, because we only have like four minutes left. So um, when you go to Google Classrooms, the uh, summary that I just went over is there, so you can look at that on your own. Um, I also found the video for uh, Atticus's closing argument, so you can watch that. It's about six minutes. It's the black and white movie version, and it covers it pretty well. The only thing um, it leaves out is uh, Scout's reaction and uh, Dill's um, interaction with uh, Dolphus Raymond are in this clip. Um, there is a quiz over chapter 20. Uh, chapter 20 is pretty short, so the quiz is actually relatively short too. I think it's only five questions, maybe six. Six, yeah. Um, all of them are multiple choice except the second question, so it's not incredibly difficult. Um, I did want to point out to you the fifth question has two answers, so for the fifth question you need to pick two answers. Um, all of these um, are covered in the summary that I just went over. So if you need to look back to the summary to help you find the answers, um, they're there as well. Um, Malachi, since you got here late, I'll also just want to point out in brief before I run out of time, on April 20th, I put on a speed read challenge, and that is a um, simple fluency exercise. What you do is you pick one of these 40 stories, and you only have to pick one each week so you won't actually do them all. None of the stories are longer than a page, page and a half. Um, so they should only take you like, you know, two, three, four minutes to read. Um, what you have to do is read, write down the passage's name so I know which one you read, um, and then record how long it takes you to read it during your first, second, and third reading. The idea is that you uh, time yourself with a stopwatch. Um, on your cell phone, there's probably a stopwatch or on a computer, or you can have a parent or sibling time you. Uh, the idea is that by reading this out loud, that will kind of take the place of you guys reading in the classroom. Um, that way your uh, fluency stays up and hopefully improves. So uh, do either of you have any questions um, while I'm here? We have a couple of minutes left. Um, I don't know if you've uh, started on the packet yet, but I sent those home um, already. Uh, I put the answers to the first week's. Uh, section of the packet on here and you can click that it's actually titled answer to the language arts portion of the packet so uh, week one answers it doesn't have answers to everything but has answers to the language art sections and I think the vocab section um, I'll put week two's up on Thursday I don't want to put the answers up before you guys have a chance to do them though um, so while you're here do you have any questions you would like me to go over or Okay. All right. Um, so I only have about a minute left. So um, that's basically what you need to do for this week is uh, read chapter 20, um, watch the closing arguments video, take you about six minutes to watch that, and then take the quiz. Um, and then the speed read challenge is there. Uh, the idea is that you do one of those every week. And uh, you could time it with your cell phone or um, have your parent time you or however you want to do that. But that's basically it. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, I'll put up um, the second week's packets answers on Thursday. But, okay. Good seeing you, Malachi. I'll give you credit for being here. Talk to you later. Bye.